I don't know where on this island John had this vision. We know it was a Roman penal colony off the coast of Ephesus. It seems that there was a quarry here where there was basically prison labor, but John would have been very old at that time, too old to dig in a quarry. We just know it was here. Some people try to date the book of Revelation early. By early, I mean before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Others, particularly dispensational Christians, will date it later, during the persecution of the emperor uh, Domitian, at the end of the first century, around 90 AD, thereabout. After the destruction of the temple. Okay. There are things in Revelation that could not have happened before 70 AD. Okay. And it did not happen in 70 AD. Too much is missing. Additionally, if John was writing this stuff before 70 AD, why is there no reference to this stuff elsewhere in the New Testament in any apocalyptic form? There isn't. It just doesn't add up. The events didn't happen. Apocalypse means unveiling. There is no new revelation in the Bible. Apo is out of and Kulipto, lift, you know, we lift the veil. There's no new revelation in the Bible. There is simply a clearer understanding of what is already in there. Okay. In a sense, we might say that Revelation is to the New Testament what Daniel is to the Old. They, broadly speaking, saw the same things from differing aspects. John in greater detail. Turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 12. Verse 4, but as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. This is a sealed book. It's there, it exists, there's no new revelation, but what was there is sealed. John sees what Daniel does. Revelation, you have seven seals. In other words, what is written in those scrolls cannot be revealed until the seal is broken by the Lamb, when he gives the decree in chapter 5. It's sealed. Be very careful of people who tell you they have it all figured out. On the other hand, be doubly careful of people who tell you don't worry about figuring it out. This was one of the many weaknesses of Martin Luther. He has left a very nasty heritage in many ways, including anti-Semitism, including his endorsement of debauchery and murder in the Peasants' Revolt, and including a lot of bad theology as well as good theology. He virtually didn't consider it canonical and saw no point in reading it. While in fact, the book of Revelation is the only book of the Bible that conveys a special blessing on reading it. As we get closer to the time of the Lord's return, to the time of the Gentiles coming to a close, this book, eschatology generally, becomes more important. Satan does not want people to do this. He'd rather have Luther's. So he raises up people like that to deceive the church. We all know who some of these are. People like Rick Joyner, who says the raptures of the devil. Or Gerald Coates, who says the, fan the rapture is a fantasy and a myth. We know about that. The latest deceiver is Rick Warren. Don't get into eschatology, last day's prophecy. It's a distraction. <laughs> prophecy is being fulfilled every day. The Middle East, global events, environmental changes. Let us destroy those who are destroying the earth. Oh no, keep away from that stuff, says Rick Warren. And people will listen to him rather than listen to the word of God. 
In the Jesus movement, the last time there was a revival in the Western world, the developed world among the hippies in the late 60s, early 70s, people were hungry for eschatology. They used to say, Maranatha, Maranatha, Maramaic, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The bookshelves in Christian bookshops were filled with books about the return of the Lord. Some good, some not so good, but everybody was interested in it. The fact that we are more than 30 years closer to his return, and there is far less interest now than there was 30 years ago, I have pointed out many times, is a deception in itself. Satan does not want people reading or studying this book and its partner books in the Old Testament or the Olivet Discourse or Paul's commentaries in the epistles. Let's understand now. There are four approaches. I apologize to those who know this. The first is preterism. It already happened. It has no future meaning. The first kind of preterism is held by liberals, by unsaved Protestants, usually. They have a presupposition. It works something like this. We can't be sure there's a God or there is no God. And even if there is, he doesn't know the future. And even if he does, he wouldn't tell Isaiah or Daniel. Therefore, because Isaiah prophesied by name King Cyrus 200 years before his birth, obviously Isaiah didn't write the book of Isaiah. Or Daniel could not have known the history of the Maccabee Revolt and those events surrounding Philip II and Alexander the Great that we studied in, in Macedonia so accurately. Therefore, Daniel didn't write Daniel. These things are post facto. They call it ex vaticinia interpolations. Somebody came along later and inserted it and tried to make it look like a prediction. There are liberals who do that. Unfortunately, you have people claiming to be evangelicals who do that. One of which is Clark Pinnock. God doesn't know the future. He's considered an evangelical theologian. Dangerous man. But then you have those who say, holding the preterist position, these things were fulfilled in 70 AD. 70 AD is indeed a type or a shadow of the last days, but Jesus did not come in 70 AD. The Olivet Discourse is not just Matthew 24, it is 24 and 25. Jesus did not separate the sheep from goats in 70 AD. He did not give people their eternal reward based on what they did with their talents in 70 AD. If Satan is bound, I want to know who keeps letting him go. Additionally, Jesus said, the Great Tribulation will be something that nothing has bad has ever happened before or will since. Well, worse things than 70 AD happened before 70 AD. The destruction of the first temple happened the same day of the Jewish calendar, Tisha B'Av. And worse events have happened both to the Jews and the church and the world since. The Holocaust of the 30s and 40s. Bar Kokhba's rebellion in the second century. Far worse things have happened to the Jews before and since. Far worse things have happened to the church in terms of persecution. And far worse things have devastated the planet. It is a lot of nonsense. But this is what these people will believe. These people are caught up in a deception. A lie of the devil called post-millennialism. They don't believe in the millennial reign of Jesus. Among people claiming to be evangelical who will pr promote this ever the most are two kinds. Hyper-Calvinists who are called Reconstructionists. and hyper-Pentecostals who are called Kingdom Now, Dominion Theology, the Kansas City Prophets type stuff, all that kind of stuff, the Restoration Movement. We're going to conquer the world for Christ before he comes. Those are the people who hold to preterism. You have both evangelicals and liberals holding to varying forms of it. It already happened, it has no future meaning. The second is historicism. 
This was held by the Protestant reformers. They said it had a prophetic meaning, but it's nothing specific. It's something that is ongoing and dynamic throughout history. Every pope is an antichrist, they said, and correctly. Therefore, we should not look for two ultimate beasts at the end of the world so much. Every pope is that. Whichever prince or emperor was the head of the Holy Roman Empire at the time, whichever pope there was, well, that could be seen as the antichrist and false prophet. Well, in some way, they're right. They're right in what they say. They are wrong in what they negate. Additionally, it is very arbitrary where you would find the historical fulfillments of these things. But they say it's something ongoing throughout history. The papacy is the Antichrist. That was their thinking. Still believed in places like Northern Ireland. Poemicism is what some Lutherans say. If they read the book of Revelation at all, it is only poetry to encourage us during times of persecution. Then there are the futurists. Those who say it has a future prophetic meaning. Those who went with Barry Smith and the late Barry Smith and with Hal Lindsey, it has a future meaning. That is what the Gentile church says. The problem is they are reading a Jewish book with a Gentile mind. They are reading a Hebraic book with a Hellenistic orientation. Biblical apocalyptic combines Jewish apocalyptic with Greek. It begins long before the book of Revelation. It begins with 1st and 2nd Enoch in the Apocrypha, where Jewish concepts were put into the Greek language about the last days. It's a combination of the two. They understand the Hellenistic aspect, the Greek aspect, but they fail to take into proper account the Jewish one. In terms of its literary symbolism, the book of Revelation is the most Jewish book in the New Testament. It's always Jesus as the son of David, having the key of David, this kind of thing. Right from chapter 1, he appears in a mixture of regal and priestly colors. A priest had to be a descendant of Aaron, a king, a descendant of David. Only the Messiah could be both. When Yeshua, when Jesus hung on the cross for our sin, in my place and in your place, Pilate puts the sign, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. Hebrews tells us he was indeed the high priest making atonement on the altar for our sin when he hung on the cross, but he was also the king. Only the Messiah could be both high priest and king. Now in Messiah, we're all priests and kings. Only he's the high priest and he's the king of kings. Okay. They don't understand the Jewish background. There is a fifth approach. The fifth approach is this one. It is the Midrashic approach. It is what you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls and it is what you see in the New Testament. The Gentile church says one of these four is correct. The Midrashic approach is different. Jesus was a rabbi, Paul was a rabbi, and they taught the way other rabbis of the epic did. Look at Matthew 24, verse 15. The abomination of desolations, the shikutz hameshomem, spoken of by Daniel. Jesus in John 10 celebrated the Jewish feast of Hanukkah. Jesus knew that Antiochus Epiphanes, as we studied on the mainland, would set up an image in the temple. And that he did that. Jesus knew the Maccabees liberated the temple. He celebrated the holiday himself in John 10. Jesus took something that already happened and made a prophecy out of it. He used preterism. Not in the way the liberals do, not in the way the hyper-Calvinists do, or the Kingdom Now people do, but he used a Jewish form of preterism. Prophecy of this type is not a prediction and a fulfillment. It is a pattern. Multiple fulfillments. 
Each fulfillment is a picture, a type of the final one. You have to understand each fulfillment to understand the ultimate abomination. Right now on the Temple Mount you have the Mosque of Omar. It says, God has no son from the Surah and the Koran. Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. What does it say in 1 John? This is Antichrist. Hadrian leveled the temple, uh, leveled the temple mount. The temple's already gone. And he rebuilt a pagan temple to Jupiter in a city called Aulina Capitolina. There was another abomination on the temple mount. Constantine's nephew, Julian the Apostate, tried to rebuild the temple to repaganize the Roman Empire, where the Jewish temple had been, and all these mysterious fires happened. That was another one. There are many abominations of desolation, but they're all pictures of the final one. Pattern. Just like you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, prophecy is pattern. The New Testament handles the Old the same way as the Dead Sea Scrolls do. It understands there is multiple fulfillment to prophecy. That events are repetitive. The best way I can explain this is this. You have an alpha and an omega. Alpha, omega, alpha, omega. Israel was at the center of the earth. So the gospel could spread in all directions. We talked about this. In the Eastern worldview, you don't worry about Alpha and Omega because everything follows the annual cycle. Death of winter, new birth of spring, the harvest. The Eastern world, like the Hindus, have a circular view of history. That's what Baal worship had, a circular view of history. That was the East. The Western worldview had a linear view of history. We're progressing towards an eschaton. The biblical view of history is neither. The biblical view of history is yes, the same things happen over and over but it's still progressing towards an eschaton. You understand? The biblical worldview is this one. Combining the East and the West. The book of Revelation combines Oriental Judaism with Hellenism. Okay. The orientation has to be that. If we don't understand the orientation, we'll never get the hermeneutics right and how to interpret it. We have to understand God's view of history and of prophecy. So there are many abominations on the Temple Mount. There's one there now. Historicism is true. It's something ongoing and historically dynamic. But then John did, of course, write to encourage the church at Jesus' instruction, when all the other apostles had been martyred, he was the last one left, and the people thought Jesus was coming, where is he? Only John is left. They had to be reminded of their eternal future. Hence, yes, it was polemicism. But it still has this future coming meaning. The biblical view is the Midrashic one. All four are correct. All four are simultaneously correct. The four-legged table. If one leg is missing, the table is not going to be very stable, is it? All it does is take, put a little much too much weight on one side of the table, it's going to fall in. All four are correct. The Midrashic one is the correct one. Don't listen to the theological seminaries. They're following a Hellenistic worldview.
to. That's for the people who didn't know these things. Is everybody clear about what I said? We can proceed. Okay. It's a complicated book. And things which are complicated easily lend themselves to being confused. But remember, it is sealed. It is sealed. We cannot unseal it by intellectual means. And it cannot be unsealed until God's time. There have been crackpots in history and in the last hundred years who claim to have it unsealed. And they proved to be crackpots. One of which was William Branham, total crackpot, heretical crackpot, a madman. Yet there's still people who believe in him. Let's clear up certain things that people get confused about. Turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians. Let's look at this idea of the last trumpet. Is the last trumpet that he's coming with the, for the, with the rapture and resurrection, is that the last trumpet in Revelation? First Thessalonians, chapter 5, about the day of the Lord. He's coming like a thief in the night. Okay. We've explained before, the night is the most common metaphor for the great tribulation. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? The bridegroom comes for the bride in the night in the Song of Solomon and in Matthew 25. He's coming like a thief in the night. Work while you have the night, for light will come when no man can work. Paul explains much in Thessalonians about the coming of Jesus. Much. Okay. But he tells us something further. He tells us that Jesus comes and the resurrection takes place with the blasting or the blowing of the trumpet of the Lord. A distinction must be made, strictly speaking, between the trumpet of the Lord and the trumpets of the angels. In Revelation, these angels have the trumpets. Of course, they all ultimately come from the Lord, but this is something different. We read in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians the following. Verse 16, with the trumpet of God, the ark, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. We read about the trumpet again at the resurrection. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, we shall be changed. This is one of the things that has confused people the most, is the last trumpet in Revelation that the angel blows the same as this trumpet. Let's turn to Revelation, please. Chapter 11, and the seventh angel sounded, in verse 15, and there arose loud voices in heaven. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom 
of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. Is that when the rapture and resurrection are? Some people say yes. Well, it's the last trumpet. Again, they're reading it with a Western mind. There were two kinds of trumpets. In the Feast of Trumpets, you had these crafted silver horns. But then you also had, for the last trumpet, something different. The days of awe between trumpets and atonement correspond to this very dark period at the end of the age. Remember Daniel was tested for 10 days? The church of Smyrna, Satan will put you in prison 10 days. 40 is the number of divine testing, 10 is when it comes from an adversary, essentially. Although God allows it. At the end of those 10 days, you have another trumpet. Turn to Leviticus 23, please. Verse 24, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a reminder by blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. The Baal Tekoa blows like this. <laughs> Fix notes. This heralds the coming tribulation. for the Jews. But the last trumpet, turn to Leviticus 25, please. Verse 9. Then you shall sound a ram's horn abroad on the ninth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. That is on the 50th year. You shall sound a horn all through your land on Yom Kippur. The last trumpet was not the last silver one blown on trumpets. It was the shofar blown on the day of atonement in the year of Jubilee. Okay? When Joshua was told to blow the trumpets to make the wall come down, was that a silver trumpet or a ram's horn? Remember, it's a pattern. Look, please, to the book of Revelation. Chapter 8. When he broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven a half hour.
Okay. You had seven seals. But from the seventh seal, the seventh of the seven, you had the subset of seven trumpets. Got then chapter 11, two witnesses. And then you have the last trumpet. This world has become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. The way a Jewish Christian would have read that in the first century church is different than the way they teach in theological seminaries if they teach it at all. It is Midrash from Joshua. Chapter 6. What did they have to do when they assaulted Jericho? They had to march around how many days? But the seventh day, how many times? There were two witnesses. But before any of this happened, Joshua had to send in two spies to rescue the Gentile woman, remember? These two witnesses in Revelation 11, Zechariah 4, they're around for some time. They blow the last trumpet. This city has been given to us by the Lord. Remember, it is pattern. Moses represents the law, but he also represents Jesus in his first coming. Brings us out of Egypt through the water of baptism into the promised land after covering us with the blood of the Lamb. Except he can't bring us into the promised land, only to it. Right? Moses is a picture of Christ in his first coming. But because he represents the law, he can't bring them across the Jordan. Now, this is due, of course, his sin. He struck the rock more than once and so forth. Joshua has to lead them into the promised land. Joshua is a picture of Christ in his second coming. When they passed under the rod of Joshua, that is the judgment of the saints for their apportionment, how much reward they would get. Remember? based on their fidelity in the wilderness and all that stuff. The conquest of Joshua, entering the land, taking down Jericho, setting up the kingdom, is a picture of the return of Christ. See what I mean? It's what happens in Revelation. It's the same pattern. It's all in the book of Joshua. It's Midrash. He comes with his saints to establish his messianic kingdom. The last trumpet is what we read about. Now this is obviously quite different than the way they would teach you to look at the Bible in most Bible colleges. The point is, tragically, most of them wouldn't have much of a clue.
the trumpets were not silver ones, they were ram's horns. When the silver trumpet is blown, it is God's warning to his people. When the shofar is blown, it is God's judgment on those who are not his people. When the silver trumpet is blown, it is God's warning to those who are his. When the ram's horn is blown, it is God's wrath upon those who are not. Yes, he comes at the last trumpet. The final warning. He comes at the last silver trumpet. This stuff you read with these angels does not correspond to the Feast of Trumpets. It corresponds to what you see in Jericho. You understand? It's about judgment. It's about wrath. It's not about warning. There will be a final warning to the church. Then he'll come. He comes at the last trumpet. That's for us. These angels, their judgments correspond to the Shofar. Okay. The book of Joshua, the conquest, when they enter the land, is a picture of the saints go marching in. There is a number of things that teach about the return of Christ, one of which is the conquest of Joshua. He leads us in, there's a judgment of the saints, and you get this, and you get that, and you get Philadelphia, and you get Cleveland, and you get Dorchester, and you get the Highlands of Scotland. There's an apportionment. Okay, there's an apportionment for the Jewish believers, and then there's an apportionment for the nations. Now this deals with the millennium, we're not going into that now, but that's what we have to understand. This is about coming back with the saints, not for them. The last trumpet in Revelation of the angels is not coming for the saints, as in rapture, resurrection. It is coming with the saints. This kingdom has become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. Everybody clear? The last trumpet of the resurrection is something different. That's the first thing that people often get wrong they equate the last trumpet of Corinthians and Thessalonians with the last trumpet of Revelation, not looking at the fact that there are two different kinds of trumpets blown for two different kinds of people at two different times for two different purposes. You have to understand the Jewish background. Next error. Chapter 4, verse 1. Something happens here. John is raptured, as it were. It appears he's raptured, or at least he sees something. Come up hither, he's raptured. I heard something like the sound of a trumpet. They assume that that's the trumpet of the rapture. After the seven churches' ages are over. Now let's wait a second. These seven ages... Represented by the seven churches. Oops. Worse than an x ray. Everything is sevens. Seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of vials, seven persons, and there's seven new things. 
Seven, 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 seven. It's all sevens. These sevens correspond to the age of the Gentile church, the time of the Gentiles. We're talking about seven churches that existed in Asia Minor, Turkey, the closest to here being Ephesus, not far from here, at the end of the first century. These seven churches literally existed. Their Greek names tell us something about their character. And they are pictures of seven kinds of churches that can exist at any time in history with special reference to the last days. But above all, they are seven consecutive periods. Somewhat overlapping. If you're interested to know more, I'm afraid you'll have to come with us in April. We'll be back here in Patmos for only one day, but we do the seven churches in April and we go into this. What will happen to each one of these churches in the last days? What will happen to the persecuted church, like Smyrna, in the last days? What will happen to the Roman church, Thyatira, continuing sacrifice in the last days? If you want to know that, you can come in April. We're not dealing with that now. I simply mention it in passing. What we are mainly concerned with now is this. Seven seals. Most of the events surrounding the return of Christ and leading up to it, the rapture and resurrection, most of those events occur during the time period of the seven seals. The things concerning the church that will be here at that time are focused largely on the seven seals. Okay. Once the church is removed, something happens. The age of grace has come to an end. In the book of Revelation, God goes back dealing with man the way he was in the Old Testament. It's no longer grace. He's the God of wrath. The judgments that came in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the judgments in the days of Noah, the judgments on Egypt and the Exodus, the fall of Babylon. He is the God of wrath. Same God, but grace has come to an end. He goes back dealing in vengeance, avenging his people. Secondly, once the church is out of here, he turns his redemptive purpose back to Israel and the Jews. The doctrine of the tribulation saints is greatly overstated out of all proportion to what the Bible says about it. The pre-tribulation people have to do that to make sense of something that makes no sense. The seven seals concern us getting out of here if we are here at the time. What comes after it is something different. Okay. It is God pouring his wrath out on the kingdom of Antichrist, the day of the Lord. Then his focus redemptively is to saving Israel, primarily. We are in April concerned with this. We'll be somewhat concerned with this relative to Israel and the Jews, but we are mainly concerned with this, the seven seals. We'll be looking at the rapture. We'll be looking at the Antichrist. We'll be looking at what will happen once we're not here to a degree. But our main concern is what's going to happen when we are here, before we leave, and when we leave. There is an entire chapter in the book of Revelation 
dedicated to the rapture. Now, the thinking of these people is Revelation 4, 1 and 2 is the rapture. After the age of the church, John comes up. As we will see, that is not true. The rapture happens later. John is brought up and he sees heaven. On the Thanatology tapes, the biblical understanding of death and the afterlife, we talk about time. All time is based on planetary motion. All clocks work by measuring planetary motion, except for atomic clocks, which work by measuring particle emission. But even atomic clocks have to express time in terms of planetary motion, nanoseconds and things like that. There is no way to calibrate time other than planetary motion, except with an atomic clock, and even that can only express it in terms of planetary motion. In other words, well, it's, how can you quantify mass? The amount of matter something uh, contains. Well, weight. <laughs> weight is the only way that we can practically quantify mass. Even though weight does not equal mass, weight is the way you express mass. Okay. We have two Greek words for time. Chronos, Kairos. Kairos is the clock. Eternity is not a clock that keeps going. That is not eternity. Eternity is no clock at all. It is outside of time. But what you do have in eternity is the other kind of time, chronos. The order of events from where we get chronology. In other words, the vision of the woman in Revelation 12 with the baby, that doesn't have to follow the seven seals that happens during it. It's not written in Kairos. It's written in Kronos. The fifth seal will be followed by the sixth, the sixth by the seventh. But unless you have a Kronos, this is the order of vials, this is the order of seals, don't think of it in terms of time. Think of it in terms of order of events outside of time, if that makes sense. Now, of course, it doesn't make sense, except for one thing. When you enter eternity, you go out of time. That is one of two reasons why the Bible speaks about the death of a believer as sleep. One reason is we wake up again, but the other is our consciousness enters a different dimension. When you sleep, you can see dead people alive again. And it makes perfect sense. When you sleep, you can see things that make no sense in your waking hours, but make perfect sense in your dream. You can see past events happening in the present. You can see future events happening in the present. Past, present, and future are the same when you dream. You have gone to sleep. Paul says, do not believe, be not grieved for those who have fallen asleep in Christ. Our consciousness enters a different realm. What happens when you die? You go to sleep. Are you unconscious when you are asleep? No, you are unconscious of events in time and space, but you are not unconscious. Your consciousness is elsewhere. Like Lazarus and the rich man, you are in the conscious presence of Christ. But there is no kairos. It's outside of time. 
Past, present, and future are all the same when you dream. Past, present, and future are all the same in eternity. There's only Kronos, there is no Kairos. That's the best we can explain it biblically. Sleep. Don't think that the events in chapters 12 and chapter 13 happen after the seven seals. They happen during it. It's only where you have a chronos, a chronology of, of events that one has to follow the other. And that, of course, is also outside of time. In chapter 4, John enters this realm. He goes outside of time. But in chapter 5, he sees the seals. And he's told that God has a people of every nation. Yet he begins by identifying Jesus in verse 5 as the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. The root of David, the shortish Eshai, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Until Jesus opens the seals, nobody knows what's in there. However, Jesus on this island brings John and shows him. Because now he's no longer waiting for an event to happen in the future of time. He's outside of time. You understand? The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. In time, he couldn't see this stuff. In time, we can't understand it as such. So he had to go outside of time. This book gives us a keyhole into eternity. What are you going to see when you give up the ghost? You're going to see what John saw. What am I going to see? I'm going to see what John saw. But let's look. You then have these seals. So the second mistake is to equate chapter 4 with the rapture. That was not the rapture of the church. How do we know? Because we are told that he still has a people that is composed of people from every tribe and every nation. They're still there, waiting for something to happen. Nobody could open it. Stop weeping. Somebody is worthy to open it. Worthy art thou to take this book, in verse 9, and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them do to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Again, upon the earth. Let no one tell you there is no millennial reign of Jesus. How can they reign upon the earth if there is none? How can the meek inherit the earth if one doesn't exist? There must be a millennium. Why? Because in order to be the Christ, in order for Jesus to be the Christ, Yeshua must be the Messiah. But for him to be the Messiah of the Jews, he has to fulfill all these holidays and all the prophecies. Not just the spring ones, the autumn ones. Not just the son of Joseph ones, the son of David ones. Jesus did not fulfill the son of David prophecies in his first coming. If there is no millennium, Jesus cannot be the Jewish Messiah. And if there's not the Jewish Messiah, he's not the Christ. There must be a millennium. All this other nonsense, post-millennial, this was invented by Augustine to accommodate Constantine making Christendom the religion of the state for political reasons. It comes from Roman Catholicism, it comes from Greek Orthodoxy, it comes from Reformed Protestantism, but it does not come from the Word of God. The early Christians believed in a literal millennium. The reign upon the earth. But it hasn't happened yet. These seals will bring it about as they're opened. 
כן? Fourth error. People make things synonymous which are not synonymous. Perezmos. Testing in a negative sense. Testing by adversity. Philipsis. Tribulation. Philips and Magnamon, Great Tribulation. Orge. Wrath. It is a big error to try to make these things synonymous. They are quite different from each other. Pre-tribulational people make these things synonyms. Well, the Church of Philadelphia was a faithful church and they won't be here for the testing, therefore the rapture must be before the tribulation. That's the way they reason. Essentially, what they're saying is tribulation equals wrath. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Great Tribulation is Satan's time. The Day of the Lord, the wrath of God, is God's time. Within certain parameters for a fixed period of time, this belongs to Satan. As Jesus came in the flesh to do the will of his father, the beast of Revelation, the one we popularly call Antichrist, will come to do the will of Satan. It belongs to Satan. Wrath, the wrath of God, takes place during the day of the Lord. One belongs to Satan, one belongs to God. Remember, two times, time and a half time, the full power given into the hand of Antichrist will be based on the following. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Well, you gave Christ three and a half years I want equal time. So the laws and times will be given into his hand for two times a time and a half time. This belongs to Satan. This belongs to God. There is nothing in scripture that teaches that 
God's people who are faithful will experience his wrath. On the contrary, we are told we are not appointed for his wrath. Paul tells us specifically. But that's not the same as tribulation. Think of the money preachers. Because they have grown up in a Western world where there's material affluence, they rewrite the gospel of materialism. God wants you rich. We don't have to suffer. Pre-tribulationism is simply a moderated form of that same mentality. Somehow being from California or being from England means that you're different or better than the Christians being persecuted in China and Saudi Arabia. It is simply a modified form of the same error. The scripture is clear. No, we will not suffer the wrath of God. But the wrath of Satan? Turn with me please to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let us look at points to remember before we have a break. How long have I been going? What time is dinner? 6.30. Okay. Points to remember. Turn please to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Remember, the epistles are sanctified commentary. We regard you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Okay. What's Paul saying here? Well, as we read on, the Antichrist must be revealed before the day of the Lord will come. Matthew 24, 29, please. Remember the Thessalonians were being persecuted when he wrote that to them. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with great power and glory. And he will send forth an angel with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. What does Jesus say? Before the tribulation of those days? Jesus said, the rapture is after. It's plainest meaning, it's after. Turn to Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, please. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, should be completed also. Does that sound like pre-tribulation? We're into chapter 6 now.
Revelation 7, 14. Who are these? And I said to my Lord, you know, and he said, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. After trib, here the adjective is used, out of great trib. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. And I saw the thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. They were beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus. Now notice the idea of being beheaded. And the mark. How many people have been with us to Israel? What to Israel? Have you seen the Muslim women with the writings on their face and on their forehead? Verses in the Quran? You've seen that, yes? New Agers like tattoos, don't they? Not only drunken sailors, and they have New Age symbols. Talk about implanted microchips and the rest of it, but you will have religious marking already in Islam. What is the normal way of execution in Islam? Decapitation. You have the American and British government, despite terror, importing people from Saudi Arabia as long as they have money, giving them total freedom to build mosques, despite the fact that they decapitate Christians in their own country. The American government, the British government, the politicians in the West will let these people build Islamic institutions. We have a picture of Pope John Paul II kissing the Koran, a book that says God has no son. When you have Babylon the Great in full operation, and you have this Islamization of Europe, where it marries Christendom. What's the big thing with the Catholics now? Mary, she'll save us. Our Lady of Fatima. What is the most common woman's name in Islam? Fatima. You see what's happening? The stage is being set. Islam says it's going to Islamize Europe. They're going to kill the infidel. The Muslims are waiting for the Mahdi. The Christians are waiting for the return of Christ. Only most of them will not follow the real Christ. They'll follow one of these people Jesus warned not to follow. They'll follow an antichrist. Again, if anybody thinks George Bush is a good Christian, or that Benny Hinn is a preacher, or that, that Paul Cain is a prophet, what won't they believe? What won't they believe? What will happen when real deception comes? 2 Thessalonians 2. They come out of the tribulation. Revelation 13, 7. Yeah. 
It was given to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Oh, that's only the tribulation saints, people who get saved after we've been around. Who said so? On what exegetical basis? There is nothing in the text. The early Christians did not believe this. The pre-tribulation theory teaches that the saints are not raised up on the last day and that everything will continue on as it had after the rapture, as if it had, has after the rapture. In other words, like that book, that the Tim, Tim LaHaye's books, left behind and all that stuff. Oh, we'll be gone one day, gee, I wonder what happened to them. <laughs> it's not going to be like that. Things are not going to go on. The wrath of God follows immediately. We'll talk about that more, not in this session. The pre-tribulation theory cannot come to terms with the fact that the Latter-day Church will be tested. But Daniel 7.21 says they would be. Daniel 8.24, the shattering of the power of the holy people, says they would be. Daniel 11.32 says they would be. Revelation 6.10 says they will be. Revelation 13.7 says they will be. Revelation 24 says they will be. Everything shows that the faithful church experiences the wrath of Satan, but not the wrath of God. They experience tribulation, but not the wrath of God. There is a big difference. What do you have? The same as the money preachers in a more moderated form. We don't have to suffer because we live in Oregon. We live in Australia. Jesus says, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. It says clearly, the day will not come until we know who the Antichrist is. It says clearly the rapture is after the tribulation. Matthew 24. It says clearly these come out of it. Who has seen the closed brethren? The exclusive brethren? They're virtually a cult, aren't they? Darby was very Calvinistic in certain respects, even though he was dispensational, but then he did things that were anti-dispensational. Like his father was sprinkled babies. Darby popularized this thing in the 19th century. John Nelson Darby. He introduced this theory that he acquired from a Scottish woman named Margaret MacDonald in 1830. She supposedly had visions. Now notice there was a lot of crazy women around having crazy visions then. You ever hear of Ellen G. White? Founder of Seventh-day Adventists? An angel appeared to her. What does it say in Colossians 2? Do not take your stand on a vision or an angel someone has seen. We only base our doctrine on the Word of God. Joseph Smith, an angel appeared. Almost at the same time. How did Islam get going? How did Muhammad claim to get the Koran? An angel appeared. Fatima, Lords... They get puffed up by some vision they have seen. This stuff simply has no basis. The early Christians didn't believe it. The rapture was believed, but the idea of a secret rapture? The rapture is only secret in one sense. We do not know the day or the hour. But when the event happens, There'll be no question as to what's happening. This thing is an entire myth. 
What is really tragic is this. So many otherwise discerning people believe it. People who are premillennial. People who do not believe in the televangelists or the ecumenical movement. People who are not into purpose driven. People who are scholarly. Who read Greek and Hebrew. People who take the word of God seriously. But there's still pet things they'll hang on to. An unconditional once saved, always saved. Pre-trib rapture. Don't touch this. Don't touch. Now, most of what they say is right. Most of what they say is good. I'm talking about people here who are good people, whose ministries I would recommend. I link to them on the website. I would stand on a platform with them and do a conference. And they will do a conference with me, but not about this subject. You know who I mean. I mean good people. Not bad people. Good people. When people begin to get persecuted, and they find out being a Christian doesn't guarantee you're not going to be persecuted, it's easy to see what Jesus meant, many will fall away. If you think you're going to get out of here before it gets tough, and then it gets tough and you're not out of here, what happens? you got a problem. Well, the church has a big problem. I'm not talking about the goofballs. I'm not talking about the Toronto people or the ecumenical people. I'm not talking about the purpose-driven. <laughs> They're a lost cause as a group. The most we can do is reach individuals who are in those churches and get them out. But as a movement, they're lost causes. I'm talking about the remnant. The remnant needs to get its theology right. Jesus and Paul could not be any more clear. No, we do not experience the wrath of God. But yes, we have to know who the Antichrist is. There is a coming tribulation.